<laughs> so thank you so much for everyone who is here already. And thank you for joining us for our Design 101 seminar, Interior Design and You. This is part of a three-part series that we are putting on this Thursday, next Thursday, and the following Thursday, where we're gonna help you get in touch with your inner interior designer. And don't freak out if you are unsure if that exists inside of you, because I promise you at the end of today's session, and if you join us for sessions two and three, that you too will discover some great tips and tricks that you can use to help you rethink and reimagine your space. So this week, we're gonna cover your design toolkit and go through a couple of really key things that interior designers think about when they're designing a space. Next week, we're gonna explore how to discover your personal style. And then our third week, we're going to take you through an exercise of how to create your dream mood board, which will be incredibly fun and creative. So if you can join us for all three sessions, we would absolutely love to see you. But we've structured this seminar course so that if you can only pop in for one or two, each session will have its own, um, its own takeaways. So you don't have to come to all three, but if you do come to all three, they will build upon each other. And we know that you'll have an amazing experience. We also do plan to post these um, online afterwards so you can come back and watch them again or you can share them with friends afterwards. So first I wanna introduce myself and my team that's here with me tonight. I'm Alice Underwood, I'm the VP of Style at Monzi, and maybe you recognize me and Maddie, at, well, I guess you wouldn't recognize our faces, but maybe our voices as co-hosts of The Render, which is an interior design podcast that's all about the stories of interior design, and I would love to dig into history there. And we're also joined by Karina, who is our brand image and content person. So a lot of the beautiful images that you see in the content that we create come from this powerhouse team. So they'll be our moderators tonight. If you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat. And then at the end of our session, we'll go through and answer questions. And if there's any outstanding questions or we can't get to them all, we will um, absolutely put them together and share them. Probably in a blog post would be a great place to share them. But I'm excited to hear your, um, your feedback and your questions from our session tonight. So let's jump in. So tonight we're really talking, like I said, about that toolbox how to have everything that you need to think about your space like an interior designer would. So we're gonna talk about five key elements today. Color, pattern, scale and proportion, materials and texture. And we'll look at some do's and don'ts. We'll show you some imagery that we created here at Mozzie, some renders, which are actually um, photo real images that aren't real photos, like this one right here. It's totally computer generated, believe it or not. We'll look at real photos and then we'll explore um, also some images from some of our favorite design inspiration and designers across the world. So let's kick it off by talking about color. Color is one of the greatest ways to make an impact in any space. So we'll break down the section by thinking about a couple of key things. One, how to choose colors for your room. Two, how to think, three different ways to think about color. And then three, creating a color palette. So deciding what colors that you want in your space can be kind of a tricky process, right? Because we're all emotionally drawn to certain colors and there might be certain colors that resonate or create different feelings within you. So I like to say start by asking yourself, one, how are you using your space? Because actually those mental and emotional associations that you have with color can be really impactful when you put the right colors in the right spaces. So think through what colors make you happy. Um, maybe what colors evoke a sense of calmness in you? Are there colors that help you concentrate? And when you're designing maybe an office, you might lean towards choosing the colors that you feel like help make you concentrate a little bit better. When you're designing a bedroom, perhaps you lean towards those colors that evoke a sense of calmness. And maybe for living spaces, that's where you pull out those colors that just really make you happy and want to spend a lot of time in a space. So really think about those emotional and mental needs that you have in a space and allow that to guide your color choices. So there's a lot though with color. So we'd like to say there's three core ways that you might think about color. 
And I have a little spectrum here for us to look at, and then we'll break down the spectrum a little bit more. So on the spectrum, we like to say there's neutral, there's pops of color, and there's bold colors. So what does it mean to have a neutral color palette? So neutral colors are hues that appear to be without color, like white, taupe, beige, black, gray, but we know that they actually do have color in them. So it's not like they're totally white, um, but they're a little bit more, um, you know, they're neutral. They're colors that can be layered in with other more bold or saturated colors, but on their own, you can create a beautiful space using just neutral colors. It doesn't have to be a dull space. It doesn't have to be boring. Actually, neutral spaces oftentimes evoke a sense of calmness. Maybe you might think of a spa or a serene setting. And so the two examples that we have here for neutral color palettes, you'll see really lean into, again, those neutral, more earthy tones that aren't super bold, but when we look at them, they're not all white spaces and they have some depth to them. So if you love neutrals, but you want a space that has a little bit more oomph to it, look to layer in some contrasting neutrals. So maybe some darker neutrals with lighter neutrals, like we've done in these two images. If you're someone who's drawn to a little bit of color, but you don't want to go all out, you are the perfect candidate for a pops of color space. Pops of color, spaces with pops of color, really tend to leverage color in either art and accessories, rugs and pillows, um, you know, so those decorative accents throughout the space. So you might have a pretty neutral base. Your furniture might be neutral. Your, um, your large pieces of furniture might be neutral. Your wall color might be neutral. Um, but you can introduce colors in those accessories that are easy to change out. So if you're also someone who is um, really into trends or kind of fickle when it comes to design, pops of color is a great strategy for you because you can change out your rug or your art when you have a change of heart about the colors that you want to see in your space. So here's one way to achieve pops of color in these two images, like I said, by using um, here on the left, we have the ottoman, the art, the pillow, and the throw that have a little bit of those bold pops. In the image on the right, you see the artwork, the rug, again, the pillows that are bringing in these warm pops of color. You can also be a little bit more bold with your pops of color by leveraging them in different ways. So you might have a large piece of furniture, like a sofa that is your pop of color, like we see on the left. And so this is a little bit more bold because it doesn't, it's not for those fickle people or the faint of heart. You kind of commit really to that sofa when you buy it. Um, or maybe wallpaper or an accent wall is another great way to weave in a pop of color in a way that you can still mix more neutral pieces with it, but it's a little bit more bold. The ultimate use of color is like what we like to say is bold use of color. And so these are spaces that are really using colors in a way that is highly saturated. Um, and there is a mix oftentimes of multiple bright shades, which creates a lot of drama. So the left, you still see we have a neutral sofa, but the image here really feels um, quite bold and saturated. So we have a rug that has that really beautiful purple color that's pulled out also by the pillows and the artwork. And then the wall is that really gorgeous saturated shade of dark green. Um, on the right, the image, which is an image from Carlton Varney, who's a fabulous designer um, that you should look into if you're not familiar with him. And he's really layering all of these amazing bold colors, such as pinks and reds and blues and greens in almost every piece in the space, um, including you'll notice there's a little pop of um, pink that you can see in the wall colors. So here we have this really bold use of color where color is essentially everywhere in the room. And like I said, that creates a highly dramatic space and something that really photographs beautifully creates a lot of energy and drama. So if you're someone who thrives in a world like that, bold colors are your way to go. So you might be asking yourself though, okay, so I'm thinking about colors I like, I've got myself on the spectrum of neutral pops or bold, but how do I create a color palette? Creating a color palette 
there's a couple of ways we like to think about um, some of our favorite ways to create color palettes. One um, is a monochromatic color palette. So a monochromatic color palette is when you pick one shade that you love. So here in this instance, we have blue as the dominant shade, um, but we have it in different hues. So uh, or we, you pick one hue. So blue is our big color here, but we see it in all of these different shades of blue. And so you'll see on the left, we have that, um, it's almost like a paint swatch when you go to the paint store and you see, here's this color from dark to light and then applied into a room. Um, if blue is a color that you're super drawn to, you can see the dark, dark blues all the way to the light, light blues. So the dominant color here is blue, and we have a blue room, but because we have all of these different shades of blue, it doesn't feel, um, it doesn't feel sterile. It feels like it has a lot of depth, and it has a lot of energy in it um, with one focal color point. So that's one way that you can use color. Now this image is definitely one of those bold uses of colors, but you could certainly do this with pops of color as well. And how you would do that is you would anchor those different shades of blue and those different accent pieces, such as the rugs, the pillows, the artwork, and you'd have one accent color throughout your space. Another example, a little bit less intense, of a monochromatic color scheme is this bedroom, which shows the sort of rust color scheme, um, which is coming through, in, in some cases, the materials, such as the leather bed here, um, but in other cases, the accent pieces and um, the wall. The shade of the wall is not it's not a crazy bold color. It's actually um, quite neutral in and of itself, but it pulls in that uh, rust color palette very lightly, and it's layered in with all of those other um, those other tones and shades of that color. So we have a space that overall is speaking to this one color palette, um, but in a little bit less of a bold way than the image we were looking at before. Now, if you're someone who likes multiple colors in a space. One strategy that you can go towards is picking out complementary colors. So for those of you who took art class back in the day, or if you're a painter, complementary colors is probably something that is very much part of your wheelhouse or your toolkit already. And in the design world, complementary colors are essentially colors, well, well in all worlds, it's uh, colors that sit opposite each other on the color wheel. So if you picture that color wheel of um, all of the colors sliced out together, Complementary colors are opposite on that circle. So popular complementary color combinations are um, orange and blue. So you'll see on the left, here we have a space that's pretty, um, it has a pretty neutral and serene base, but we have a few pops of colors in those accents. So that blue chair, the orange pillow, the blue art, the blue rug, or I'm sorry, the blue art, the blue lamp. And then the rug actually pulls in both a little bit of the orange and the blue. On the right, our complementary colors here are red and green. And you'll notice the red in the rug, the green in the chairs. We have the red on the pillows behind the sofa. And a couple of those blue pillows also kind of lean a little bit with some green undertones. So our complementary colors, what they do is they're contrasting. Because they're sitting on opposite sides of the color wheel, so they actually create a little bit of drama in the space, but in a way that is um, potentially a much more subtle than uh, some of the dramatic spaces we have seen before. So if you're looking for pops of color, but you wanna take it to the next level, complementary colors is a great place to start. And then finally, when you're thinking about colors, you might think about soft colors versus highly saturated colors. So or you might think of this as pastels versus um, primaries or again, saturated colors. So really thinking about what you're drawn to. If you like things that are a little bit lighter, a little bit, um, a little bit sometimes pastels are thought of as a little bit more youthful or even um, part of the spring season versus our highly saturated colors like on the right, which are colors that are often very bold and forward and make a huge statement in the room. So both of these rooms that we're looking at actually have a good amount of color in them, but the one on the left feels a little bit softer and a little bit more subtle, where the one on the right is much more dramatic. So you can play with the intensity of the level of color that you're adding into a space, and that will change that emotional response or feeling that you might have in that space.
So the next thing that we'll talk about is pattern, which is, is related to color because um, patterns are oftentimes highly colorful. We'll think about when and how to incorporate a uh, pattern in your space and how you might mix patterns. So there is what we like to call a safe use of pattern. So if you're someone who loves patterns, but maybe you're not quite as bold as the image that I just showed on this slide, Marissa Berenson's Moroccan home, right? Maybe that's not you. Um, you. You can introduce patterns to your space in a way that makes them feel a little bit more subtle and a little bit softer. So here are the two images. Um, we show how you can use patterns in textiles and accessories, accent furniture, art. So on the left, the image, we have patterns in the rug, patterns in that accent chair, a pattern on that, on that um, pillow on the sofa. You'll also notice the color scheme here is a monochromatic blue color scheme. So we have all those different shades of blue. And then on the image on the right, we see a subtle use of pattern as well. Again, in the rug, the pillows here. So these are ways that you can introduce patterns to introduce depth and um, you know, little pops of excitement to your space without feeling like you're going overboard. Now, if you are bold at heart and someone who loves to go overboard, um, which I myself have, have been in that camp many times in my life, um, a bold use of pattern is probably where you might find yourself. So a bolder use of pattern is when you incorporate patterns in large pieces of furniture, in wallpaper, um, a ton of different patterns mixed together in a space, you might see um, even pieces of furniture, um, like case pieces of furniture carrying patterns as well. So here we have two examples, um, and the one on the left is one of my favorite spaces in the whole world. It's Dorothy Draper's Greenbrier Hotel in West Virginia, which is um, just an iconic design space. And you'll notice if you love, if you're a lover of palm print, um, we have that palm print wallpaper resilience that originated here actually um, with Draper's Greenbrier Hotel design. So in the image on the left, we see an incredible use of layered patterns. We see wall patterns um, in the wallpaper and multiple types of, we have the stripes, we have the palms, we have the pattern on the floor, uh, we have patterns on the rugs, and they're all really um, almost like power clashing together, but in a way that creates an incredible amount of drama and introduces a number of different colors to the space. And then the image on the right um, is a beautiful photo from El Decor where we see um, an, an, a really exciting use of pattern. My favorite thing about this image is how the pattern of the sofa actually matches the wallpaper. So the sofa almost blends into the architecture of the space, but the whole space is incredibly bold. And we have that bold pattern on the sofa and the wallpaper paired with the really bold and colorful pattern on the chair, and then all of the pieces of artwork are bringing in and introducing patterns as well. So if you are looking for a bold use of pattern, um, you wanna choose bold patterns in bright colors and mix them and layer them. So if you're wondering how you actually mix patterns, um, a, few, a few things to think about are scale, color and style. So here we have an example of how you might mix patterned pillows on your sofa. And again, this is probably a little bit more of that safer use of pattern. The space itself um, gives us a really nice neutral backdrop. Um, and the sofa as well is this, um, a really beautiful, comfortable sofa. On top of it, we see a blue scheme of, um, for our color scheme. And the patterns here, we have a mixture of scale of the pattern and a mixture of colors that are coming through. So one great tip for if you're trying to mix patterns with pillows is to have some anchors that are solids. So you have those two dark um, navy solid pillows that are then picking up elements of some of the other pillows. And they're, so they're tying together with some shared hues. But then we see um, that really beautiful shibori pattern um, and then a, another um, really, really um, smaller scale pattern um, at the pillow behind it. And so together, you know, you have this, these larger prints and smaller prints that really help create little bits of drama without being so over the top.
So now we'll move on to talking about scale and proportion. So scale and proportion technically have different definitions, but colloquially they are used um, basically interchangeably. So we'll stick with that because that's probably how you're already using those definitions. But technically, um, scale most often refers to the size of a piece within a specific space and its architecture. Well, proportion is often used when describing the size and shape of one object in relation to another object within a space. So when we think about scale and proportion, though, like I said, we'll use the terms interchangeably. And really, the gist here is scale and proportion are really all about how pieces fit physically into a space and how they relate to each other. Scale and proportion help create a sense of balance in the room. So ways and times to think about scale and proportion. Think about scale within your space when you're thinking about the footprint of the space. So really um, the actual size of a space can be a real, a real um, determining factor in the pieces of furniture that you pick out. So if you have a really big space, you're probably going to buy larger furniture to fill that space. Whereas if you have a small space, you'll be looking for furniture that's slightly smaller scale, so you're not overcrowding the space. And those, those might seem like obvious thoughts, right, that you have. Um, but really, when you have a space that's really large, sometimes scale becomes really tricky to work with because you might not have enough pieces to fill up a space. And so here on the left in this rotating image, we have um, one long living room. Some of you may have the long living room conundrum that you're trying to deal with right now. It's one of the, the most challenging spaces to design, and we know that because so many of our Modsy customers have come in with a long and narrow living room. But you'll notice we have two examples of how you can create a beautifully scaled layout within a space like that. So in one example, we have a large sectional that is um, really using the corner of the room to anchor itself. Um, and then on the other side of the room, because if you just had that one seating area, um, it would feel really empty, right? And so you have to kind of think about what else am I putting in this space so that it feels, it feels full enough. Um, and so we have a, a little additional seating area on the left from that sectional. And then you might move into a space and, and realize, oh my gosh, I think, um, you know, I bought this sofa that is just a standard size sofa, that um, leather sofa that pops up in that left image. Um, and that in and of itself might feel really small in the space. Certainly would feel really tiny if it was in the same position as that sectional. And so you create balance by pairing it with other pieces in the room. And in that layout, um, we also added a, a, little, um, a little game table, a little seating area behind the sofa. So really what you wanna do is think about one, how do your sweet pieces fit within the footprint of your space? Are they, are they um, too big? Are they too small? Is there enough room for you to put everything you need in the space uh, with all of the pieces that you want? You know, if you have um, a, a really big sectional, but nothing else fits and you're dying for two other chairs, that might not be your best bet. Um, if you have a sofa that feels really, really tiny in a space, that also might start to make the space feel a little bit less balanced. So really what you wanna do is create pieces that are going to help the space feel balanced and feel full without feeling too full. So the, the other way we can think about scale in a space is within our decorative accents. So really this is that idea of how one object in a space relates to another object in the space and do they help create balance. So rugs is a place where I think we get it wrong a lot. Um, rugs are hard because one, rugs have to fit in the scale of the room, and two, rugs have to fit with the scale of the furniture. So I have a don't on this slide, um, but again, don't freak out if you're like, oh my gosh, that's what I have in my house, um, because I have the fix too. So the don't for rugs is if a five by seven rug is almost always too small, for your space. There are a few instances where five by sevens do work, but by and large, if you have a sofa or a sectional with a couple of chairs, a five by seven rug is going to be too tiny. 
And so that's this image here on the right. This five by seven rug, you see the sofa's not sitting on it, the chair's not sitting on it, that ottoman's not sitting on it. It's sort of just um, acting as this, um, this like pedestal for the coffee tables. And what happens there is when your rug is too small, it actually makes your space feel smaller than it is. So if you're looking around your living room right now and you're, and you're saying, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I have, like I said, don't worry. The fix here is actually to layer another rug under it. So here we have a larger neutral rug that's layered under that five by seven that actually takes up more of the footprint of that seating area and more of the footprint of that space and helps create a feeling of balance and a feeling of continuity in the space and actually kind of makes the space look a little bit larger because our eye is looking out and not just focusing in on this one small rug. Um, now, if you are starting from scratch, you might actually just go and buy uh, the larger size of this rug. And this is an example of an eight by 10, 10 rug in this space. And so when we flip back, you'll notice it's a pretty big difference from that five by seven. Um, so here the eight by 10, again, it really anchors the space and it makes those pieces feel more in balance with each other and with the footprint of the room. Another place that we see some challenges in scale or proportion is with accent tables. So here on the left, we have an image of a space that feels really well balanced. On the right, we have an image of a space that feels a little bit heavy and clunky. And so, you know, this is all subjective too. Um, their rules are always meant to be broken, but when we look at that image on the right compared to the image on the left, what we start to see is when you're, when you're looking at the image, it, it almost feels like the image on the right, if it were a scale, it would, it would just like tip this way. And so that really blocky, heavy um, piece of furniture that's acting as a side table almost, almost makes us feel a little bit wobbly. And so that sense of balance here is out of whack. And then, um, well, you might try to balance it with a, a very large floor lamp, like the one that's here. This one actually, um, the proportion and the size of it kind of crushes down um, that, beautiful, that beautiful tall empty wall behind the sofa. So by having that floor lamp sitting so close over the top of the sofa, actually kind of condenses and, and makes the space look a little bit more constrained. Whereas the image on the left, you'll notice it feels a little bit more open. Our eye is drawn up, which makes the space feel a little bit larger, a little bit airier, um, a little bit more room to breathe. And then the side table is much more in proportion with the sofa that we have. So when you look at the height of it, when you look at the shape and the size of it, it feels like there's much more balance there. Um, as well as the lamp on the side, again, we're not constricting ourselves and, and really um, kind of folding in on the sofa. Another place that you can practice balance, scale, and proportion in your home is with your table lamps. And this is, this is a trick that you can apply to side tables, accent tables, nightstands, any place where you're putting a table lamp on top of a surface. You wanna think about the size of that lamp in relationship to the piece of furniture that you're putting it on. So here we've got a too big, a too small, and a just right. The Goldilocks syndrome um, all the way at the end is what we want to see. So we wanna see something that feels, it feels like it belongs, right? The first one feels like that lamp might crush that table. Like if that, that lamp, um, if that table was made of a piece of paper or something, it would just be totally flattened by that lamp, which is really the lamp is the size of the table. It's even bigger. I think if we actually like took out our measurement tools, we'd see that lamp is bigger than the table. So it's just out of proportion. In the middle, um, the lamp is much smaller, but it actually kind of feels too small, where it feels like um, even maybe a little bit dinky in proportion to that table. Um, and on the right, we have a, a lamp that the size and the shape of it is actually playing really well with this side table and creating a beautiful silhouette that feels like it has balance within the space. So next, we will move on to materials. Now, materials is something that is, is probably 
one of the easiest things for us to grasp if you are um, if you don't feel like you have a design mind. Materials are literally what something is made of. So look around you and look at all the different materials that you're surrounded by. Maybe wood, leather, um, textiles, like it could be wool, cashmere, fur. Um, there's a variety of different materials that we're surrounded by, right? And everything that something is made of not only does it bring in a different color to the space, um, even if they're the same color, the way that materials reflect light um, because of their different textures creates different tonalities and depth in a space. And so you use different materials to really create um, different moments of drama or insight and intrigue into your space. So if you had a space that was, you know, all one material, um, you can imagine it, it kind of would feel very one note, like maybe you might think about, um, I don't know, my brain is just going to like a padded room, if you're like locked up in a padded room, that's sort of like a horrifying maybe vision on its own, but it's like all one material all around you and all you have is this one, this one thing to look at. Um, whereas when you have a room that's layered with different materials, as you'll see here, you have a lot of different ways that light is playing and interacting with the space. And, and like I said, that creates a lot more visual interest in your space. And so I mentioned this word texture, which is what we'll talk about um, finally. Texture is, is really the feel, the tactile feeling of all of those materials. And again, it's really reactive to how light reflects um, and, and kind of um, streams through your space. So mixing materials is the key to creating a space with layers of texture. And you'll hear this word, you'll hear designers say, um, layering texture is one of their favorite ways to create depth in a space. Layering texture means um, really just bringing in a number of different textures within a space. It keeps your space from feeling one note and it creates a ton of depth and warmth um, because it feels really inviting when you have all of these different textures. You know, you have this kind of want to be in the space, maybe to even touch things and experience them and feel them. So different textures that you might see might be within textiles and um, upholstered pieces. You might have velvets, linens, um, like tweeds. You might have jutes in your rugs or wool or um, woven cotton that creates a nubby feel. In accessories, you may have things like inlay or metals, um, etched metals even. Marble has a beautiful texture, um, a quite, um, you know, a high shine to it as well, like lacquers. You'll have natural materials and you'll have those man-made materials. But together, all of these pieces, um, when used together in a space, create, like I said, different moments and different opportunities for light to reflect differently and the opportunity to have a space that feels really beautifully designed because your eye is going to move from one piece to the next because it's going to find um, interest and intrigue. So even if you have a space that's totally neutral in design, uh, layering in textures is a fantastic way to make the space feel a little bit more dramatic and a little bit less drab. So the example that we have here is, again, a space that is quite neutral, but you'll notice there's a ton of textures in here. And I'll point out some of these textures that we have. So the pillows here are actually like a hide pillow. So you'd have that short hair fur texture, um, where this faux fur pillow here has a longer hair fur texture that's a little bit wispier. Um, there's actually a number of these different types of uh, furs throughout the space, these furs and faux furs that are creating different moments of plush texture. We have that paired with um, this uh, beautiful light wood table that has just a little bit of texture on it, but is quite smooth. The walls in this space have that shiplap, which are creating some texture as well. Um, the tapestry here has um, like a macrame texture. So it's pieces of yarn that are woven together. So you have kind of two textures actually from this one piece. One, the texture of the material itself, and then the texture of the weave. We also have a rug that has um, texture from the weave within it. And then um, this ladder right here is actually, it has the texture of natural wood. It almost has the texture if you picked up a stick or a twig from the ground. 
you would have <clears throat> a texture like this ladder. We also have um, a ceramic um, accent piece on the table and candles that would have more of a waxy texture. So while this room is pretty neutral, the way that the light is reflecting on these very different neutral pieces is really helping create a space that feels warm and cozy and really inviting. And so textures and different textures, that's the key to making your space feel like um, maybe you had a little bit of design help in creating it. So that's what we put together for you today. Those five tips, remember we talked about color, pattern, scale and proportion, texture and materials. And those are five ways that you can really bring a space to the next level. I would love to open it up to any questions that anyone has based on um, anything that we talked about today or things that we didn't talk about today that you would love to hear from. Um, and so maybe Maddie, Karina, if you have any great questions to start with. Yeah, I've been kind of keeping an eye on some on the chats and there's been some a couple themes that have popped up. I mean, first, a big burning question, Alessandra, is can people shop these looks that you've been showing us? Many of them are shoppable, yes. Um, if that is of interest, we can definitely put together a, a sort of a guide. Um, maybe after all of our presentations, we can put together a little catalog and um, share it out for anyone who attended. Yeah, I think we can even share, um, another person asked about getting a PDF of this presentation. So perhaps we can share that with links to all the products. You can Great. shop them all in one place. They're all real furniture. That's what we use to pin our designs at Monty. So that's an easy one for everyone asking where that sofa is from. It's a, it's a good one, so. <laughs> um, okay, another one while we're on the subject of texture, a couple came up a couple of times. Are there any, sort of a, a two-prong question, any textures and materials that A, go well together, like in your mind, some easy combos, and then any combos that are don'ts, ones to avoid? Ooh, okay. Hmm. I don't, I don't like too many rules of what not to do, but I, I would say maybe some things that are, we'll start with like the don'ts. Again, there, you can always break any rule. And so, but I would say some things to think about are the, the sort of, it, it, like maybe how you dress when you get dressed, right? If you're wearing something that's super dressy, you're probably not gonna put flip-flops on. So with your textures, think about that. Think about the level of, um, the level of like, Finesse, polish. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Great, <laughs> that level of finesse or uh, if something feels super formal. So if you have a texture that feels really, really formal, um, sometimes it might feel like it doesn't really go with a texture that feels really, really bohemian, for example. However, there are spaces that could pull that off beautifully. But if you're a little bit unsure, you might say like, okay, let me try to stick with textures that I think go really well together. And so some that go really well together would be um, natural textures always do beautifully well together. So thinking about jutes layered with linens, layered with wools, those sorts of things, they're all coming from the, the world, the natural world around us. And when layered together, they create um, those many different um, feelings of, um, you know, some things are softer and some things are rougher and they create something that feels very natural to us because it's what we see in the world around us. So thinking of those textures that you might see actually together in nature, albeit in different forms, but those will work well together. Other textures I love, I love um, leather with velvets. I love like velvet pillows and a leather sofa. I think that that kind of has, maybe it is exactly what I said don't do. It's kind of like the, um, like getting dressed up with a more casual piece, but it, it has something where I think the velvet pillows really um, can bring up the, um, the leather um, and kind of elevate it a little bit. Awesome, thanks Alexander. Okay, another one I saw a lot of was asking about wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and how to think about layering rugs over, over that. Is it a do, a don't, any tips yeah. and tricks? I am all for 100% layering rugs over wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. I think, especially if you have a, if you're sitting there in an apartment and you didn't get to choose the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and you are, you hate it, uh, 
layer a rug over it. Um, even if you're in a space where you actually did choose the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and it's beautiful top-notch carpeting, sometimes it's really nice to add an additional element with a rug. And so the key there is you want to pick something out that is going to contrast um, with the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting that's there. So if you have, you don't want something that's going to just blend in. So if you have a very neutral rug, um, you probably don't want to put a slightly less neutral rug on top of it. There I would encourage you to pick something out with a little bit of color. So pick something out that will actually change the look and feel of the space. Okay, mm, there's so many good ones. Um, okay, well maybe just some people are asking about what Mozzie does, like explaining these computer generated images. Maybe you could just speak to that a little bit more broadly. Absolutely, yes. So at Mozzie, we are an online interior design service that uses really cool 3D imagery, which what I mean by 3D imagery is literally, this is a 3D image, which is crazy. It's really just something that looks like a photo and um, we generate these of your space. So our designers work with you to understand your budget, your style, your hopes and dreams of the space. And then when they put together their design vision for their space, they actually put it together in a series of images of your exact room in 100% to scale with furniture products that are actually shoppable. So you, if you're, if you're challenged to visualize or maybe you have a partner that is a little bit more visually challenged, you have this deck of images that you can look at and know exactly how your room would look if you were to purchase all that furniture. Um, and even, you know, even when you work with the designer, sometimes it can be hard to see their vision of the space. And so this really bridges both worlds, your vision, your designer's vision, um, your partner's vision, your roommate's vision, whoever you live with, all together in what looks like photos of your own home. So you can make really confident decisions on what to, um, what works well, what you love, and and see the mistakes before you make them um, in your own home, right? You don't have to get the sofa in and then say, oh my gosh, that was a bad decision. And then on that um, follow-up question, Alessandra, how much does Monsi cost? How much does it cost to use the service? Ooh. Um, well, we have two packages that you can buy. Um, one is our Monsi premium package, which is $159. Am I right there? And I'm testing myself. <laughs> and then that package is you work one-on-one -on -one with the designer and you get um, these beautiful renders of your space. And then we have our Monzi Lux package, which starts at $399. Um, it is, it's $399 a room and you work with a designer. You have, um, it's a little bit more like working with a traditional interior designer. Um, there's a lot more hand-holding and guidance along the way. You'll do um, a video reveal call with them. And um, you can have a couple of, if you're, if you're thinking about making any structural changes in your space, you can kind of preview them before they're done. Or if you're in the middle of a renovation, that's the package for you too, because you can see what things would look like before they're actually done. Um, but both packages are great. With both packages, you work with an interior designer. Uh, just depends on what type of person you are and what level of help and support you need. You know, if you're the person who um, at the makeup counter, wants to go your own way and just pick everything out and pick it out on your own, premium might be your way. You still have that expert helping you, making sure that you have a space that's cohesive. If you're the person that wants the, the makeup associate to um, makeup artist to sit down and do your whole face and make you look beautiful and walk out, uh, Lux, is your, Lux is your answer. Um, and with both packages, you can also add multiples of rooms at discounted price. So if you have a couple of rooms that you're thinking of, um, it's a great way to a great way to you know design number of rooms your whole home and actually we will send everyone who's here tonight a thank you and a little special discount for any packages that you're interested in if you want to try mm -hmm. yeah okay a couple other back to sort of our subject matter at hand that i saw come in and karina if you see any other ones that you want to flag feel free to jump in but um thinking about color palettes across multiple rooms, especially, for example, in this room, you can kind of peek into the adjoining faces. How do you think about um, creating a color palette that is both room specific and can like transit across multiple spaces in your house? Ooh, that's a great question. I think when you do have open concepts or even rooms where you might peek into one room from another room, I think um, a couple things to keep in mind are one, yeah, you do want those two spaces to feel like they go together. 
right? It's a little bit different than a bedroom on a second floor and a living room on a first floor um, where, you know, no one's ever going to see them next to each other. And so they could have wildly different color palettes and it definitely wouldn't clash. So things you might want to think about are how to have maybe one similar element that goes throughout the spaces. So if you have, you know, if you choose a complementary color scheme, maybe you have um, one of those tones in both spaces. If you have a neutral color scheme, I mean, that's the easiest, right? Because um, the whole space can be neutral with those pops of colors. And that's, that's something that we actually see a lot on trend today is homes that are pretty neutral with high contrast. And every space kind of has that same feeling, but maybe with different levels of drama. But if you are someone who's looking for more saturated colors or pops of colors, you know, absolutely having a little bit of continuity. Um, and the other thing that you can do is if you love bold colors, introducing, you know, if we look back at some of these bolder color palettes that have a number of different colors in them, if you have an open space, when you're using a lot of different colors, like, oh, this is a great one too, the Carlton Barney image, um, you can pick up a couple of those different colors throughout the space as well. And so the, if, you're, if you're into those bold color palettes, kind of the more colors that you have, um, one or two of those colors might be able to show up in another space along with additional colors as well. And so if, you're, if you really commit to color, um, it's a great way to introduce it in many different shades. Alessandra, kind of off of that, what about room size and scale in relation to wall color? So like, I think a few people might struggle with their space being potentially really large with like 12 foot ceilings, or you might have someone who has a really small space, but they still want to paint those bold colors. Do you have any designer recommendations for color rules in relation to room sizes? Well, I think it depends on the type of light that you get in the room as well. And so if you have a room, sometimes if you paint a room a very dark color, it can make it feel a little bit smaller. And so, but that might not be a bad thing, right? You might lean into that idea of saying like, okay, I'm gonna create this room that feels uh, a little bit more cozy, that feels bold and dramatic. But if you're trying, like if your mindset is, I want my room to feel bigger because I feel a little bit cramped in this space, then maybe that's not the way to go for you. Um, spaces that are like, if, you, if you're a neutral person, um, white bright spaces are always they're always going to feel light and bright but for some people those might feel like very sterile and you might um they might feel even like a little bit hospital if that's if if you if you don't love those types of spaces um so you might actually lean a little bit towards some other neutrals that are a little more saturated grays are a great are a great tone to go with um, i love cool grays Make sure whatever you do in painting, you paint a swatch on your wall in the exact room that you're going to have that color tone in and watch it throughout the whole day. Because what you'll notice is when golden hour comes, that shade might change. And if that's the time of day that you sit in that room and all of a sudden that shade looks a lot more orange than it did in the morning and you don't like that orange tone, um, you might regret painting it that color. So really think about, you know, do your swatch tests and watch them over a day or two. Every room is going to show a color differently. Um, that's just one little tip. But when you're thinking about those, if you have really large walls, um, you might choose to paint just one accent wall. That's something that um, is really popular with people that kind of helps define different parts of the space and create a little bit of drama. You might also lean into a color again that is one of those neutrals like a gray or um, I personally love cooler tones for walls um, with one exception of a color that's often called rouge, which is kind of this combination of, bay, of gray and beige. Um, and it can be both warm or cool. And so it's a color that was, it was super popular a number of years ago. Um, I still think it has a place in the home because like I said, it is, um, it's a color that is neutral, but you can create a more cool tone color palette with the furniture that you put in the space, or you can let it lean a little bit more warm tone. So you're not just committing to um, a color that is um, very, very warm and will kind of always kind of push your room into the, those warm tones. Any, any other questions? 
Yeah, I think there's one around um, finding the balance between making a room feel really visually interesting. So all the things you chatted about today, like color and textiles and decor, without veering into the overload and clutter camp. Mm. So like, what are some super easy, like tactile things you can speak to about that? Definitely. Well, one thing I'm going to quote Coco Chanel, who said, take one, actually, I'm going to like chop up the quote, but basically she says, remove one thing before you leave the house, like your accessories. So basically like we're always prone to over accessorizing in fashion, which I think probably in homes as well. Um, because if you are like myself, a collector, um, there's always going to be room to edit. So I think one thing is to think about editing. Um, I think there's striking a balance and one, this depends on your personality because you can have a space like actually the space that we're looking at on screen is there's a lot going on there, right? It's pretty chocked full, it's loaded, and some people might really thrive in a space like that. Or uh, you might be more drawn to the space on the left that is well bold and colorful, is a little bit more of a minimalist vibe. So one, it's kind of identifying um, what you're drawn to and what you thrive in. If you're someone who is um, easily distracted or finds uh, surfaces that ha you know are covered in accessories kind of chaotic um, if you're a Virgo maybe this is you're more of that minimalist um, but if you're someone who is you know a glam lover over the top you might actually love spaces that feel a little bit more chocked full so one identify who you are but two um, if you're veering towards a space that is a little bit more accessorized think about being um, a little bit curated and where you're putting your accessories and how you're grouping them I love to think about the rule of three. So if you have a surface, thinking about grouping three things together and using groups of three. So if you have a large surface, you might have two groups of three on it, um, as opposed to you know a group of five and a group of seven, that might start to get a little bit overboard. But if you're a total maximalist, ah, you might just fill up that whole surface with um, your entire collection of stack retired dogs, um, potentially. Uh, that's a shout out to the render. If you guys are listeners, you'll know we talk about stack retired dogs. Um, but also, one thing that I love as a tip, if, if you're struggling with this and, and you feel like you have a lot of stuff but you're not sure what to do, is take a box and actually edit down your room, put a few things in your box, see how it feels, put that box in the closet. And when you're ready for a change, or when, if you're feeling like your space could use a little bit more oomph, take some things out of the box or swap some things that are on display. So you don't always have to have everything you own on display at all times, but you can still have it there. Um, other tips, if you are someone who has a lot of stuff, bookshelves are a great place to store decorative objects as well, mixing them in with your books. So, um, you know, it's not like they're all on one surface, but they can be mixed in with your books like bookends or, um, or really become stars of a shelf as well. You don't even have to have a book on a bookshelf. You can have all decorative accessories. All right, and with four minutes to go, Alessandra, maybe we can talk a little bit about what we're gonna cover next week and the following week in our next two sessions. Sure. Um, let me go back to our end here so next week we will be talking about how to discover your personal style so you know we leaned into that a little bit this week um thinking about who you are colors you're drawn to but next week what we'll really think about is you know there's a lot of style terms out there traditional mid-century modern glam industrial and for someone who might be newer to this field, it can be kind of intimidating to say, who am I, what do I like? And also we're all constantly inundated with beautiful imagery that is across all of these different styles. So it's not uncommon for you to love images and find inspiration in all of these different styles. But then when you're trying to put together your own space, you're, you might be looking for a little bit of cohesion. So we'll talk about how you might be able to start to identify some tent poles of your own personal style and create some direction around um, putting your own space together next week. And then our following week on October 15th, we will talk about how to create your dream mood board. And actually Karina will host this session and walk you through a 
an exercise on creating um, a mood board and how do you how do you find the emotion that you're looking for in a space, the color palette, some key pieces, and just inspiration to really lay the groundwork for how to create a design that you love and how to create a space that you love. And even if you never bring your mood board to life, it's really fun to create one. And so this will be like a tool. If you are still in quarantine or sheltering in place, or you know, you're just remote and you need a new creative outlet, um, this is a good one for you because you can just go and have fun and look at beautiful imagery and pull it together and create these digital collages in a way that is really fun. And, and maybe if you have kids too, it's a great thing that they might love to learn as well. Any, any final remaining questions or? Just where can we, are we going to share this out again? Um, where can everyone find this recording and these slides, Alessandra? Great. Well, I, I'm, I didn't anticipate so many people wanting to mm -hmm. reference this again, but we are going to post it on YouTube. So look out on our Monty channel. We'll probably put it up um, next week at some point. And then we will share out, I'll, I'll send everyone who came today a little thank you gift. Again, thank you for coming. Um, but a thank you, you guys so much with um, a coupon code if you do want to try a Monzi package out on your own. And then we'll also send follow-ups. We can put this together as a little um, little take-home PDF or booklet so you can um, reference on your own. So we'll work on that on our end and share it out with everyone who came as well. But we yes, really, we, yeah. Sorry, Maddie. We'll, we'll include, I was going to say, for I'm seeing a couple more questions pop in, we'll include all the links so you can shop the, the Monzi designs in here. They're all made with real furniture. Um, so yeah. Great. That's all I need to say. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Well, again, yeah. thank you so much, everyone who joined. Um, it was a real pleasure spending this time with you. An honor to um, to be able to come into your life and have you into my own home for this time. I really appreciate it. And follow up with any if you have any questions. You know, feel free to um, to reach out to us. You can find us on Instagram at Monzi Design. And um, you know, DM us or leave us notes in the comments, and um, we'll we'll definitely be keeping our eyes peeled for any additional questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. thanks everyone. Yeah, have a Thank great you. evening. Thanks. All right, have a great night.